Ah, hello World Wide Web, I'm Decker Shadow, the United Personality with the Best Hair. And last year we were blessed with a film adaptation of Creepypasta titled simply Creepypasta. I mean, sure, there's plenty of short films and even some feature-length movies about Creepypastas, but Creepypasta the Movie from 2023 is a 90-minute romp through several much smaller stories. Kind of like a horror anthology film. Well, technically speaking, that's that's exactly what this is. But usually those movies have like three horror stories all tied together with one overarching narrative, whereas Creepypasta the movie, on the other hand, uh, we get a bunch of stories back to back to back, kind of sort of tied together with one overarching narrative. Sometimes. It's just kind of an excuse to show us a whole bunch of Creepypasta stories. So let's take a look at Creepypasta and see a whole bunch of creepypasta stories. Do you know what a creepypasta is? Oh, I, uh, I didn't expect a quiz first thing, but yeah, a creepypasta is derived from copypasta, which is derived from copy-paste, which it's its origins of just being something that's copied and pasted and shared around ad nauseum on the internet, and creepypasta specifically falls into the horror genre in that. It's kind of like ghost stories and urban legends, that kind of thing. It's a scary story shared on the internet. I mean, it, yeah, if you want to be incredibly reductive about it, but that does kind of skip over the part that makes a creepypasta a creepypasta. You make mainly the pasta part. But they're much more than that. Well, not that much more. It really doesn't take that long to just cover the basic rules here. I could tell you why, but I'd rather show you. Well, we had to stretch a two-minute explanation over 90 minutes. So we gotta get the plot or what stands for it, established. A narrator's like, hey, there have been multiple disappearances that seem to start with this 14-year-old girl who was probably that other narrator. Wouldn't you know it? She wrote creepy pastas. Something, something connected to the string of disappearances. Detectives believe the clue to her disappearance could be found in her most recent story, which apparently remains unfinished. Jesus, lady, you gotta stay focused. You can't just start another project when you've got so many other WIPs. We each have a story within us. Stories that tell us who we are. Not all of them have a happy ending. Hey, listen, lady, I've been reading creepypastas for years, and I cannot remember a single one of them with a happy ending. Anyway, let's introduce the closest thing to a protagonist we have for this movie. Marco, played by Anthony Solano. He walks in, finds a pile of corpses, and decides to say fuck it and leave. But he receives a message. Uh, yeah. Brother finds himself in a house full of dead white people. He ain't sticking around. But Marco is a horror movie character and therefore not the brightest bulb in the box. Much like the people who chose the creepypastas for this movie. Sure, we see a reference to Ben Drowned in the background, but it's not even a particularly accurate one, and that's the best we get out of this story. Oh, right, the stories. Well, you see, Marco here has arrived to retrieve the only copy of his story. But wouldn't you know it, it's on a thumb drive and he has no idea which one. So the only way to figure that out is to pop it into the handy dandy laptop and check. And despite the fact that he is clearly looking for his specific story, and this is very much not it, and no reason to just pull it out and pop in another one to check, let's just kick back and watch it for funsies. Yeah, that, that, that is the plot thread holding this movie together. On a dark and stormy night, we see public domain horror movies, and a poster on the wall that I'm pretty sure these guys did not pay the licensing fee for. But the point is this young lady is being told by her friends that she snores and talks in her sleep. Not believing her, her friend posits that she download a sleep recording app to hear for herself the strange things she says while unconscious. But of course, this is a creepypasta, so be cautious now. Porque a lo mejor... No me digas eso. Santa mierda! So, so much for that Skype call with her friend. No worries, it's late and she should be heading to bed anyway. With the sleep tracking app. And that night, it gives her strange notifications. Scary noises before they even appear, spoiling the scares while at the same time making them even scarier. 
investigating, she receives more notifications, resulting in more scary noises. Soon enough, she hears one of the TV coming back on. So running over to investigate, it shows us nothing. Now don't let that spoil the mood. Because there's a monster under her bed that grabs her, pulls her in, and eats her. Funny, didn't receive a single notification about that. Because it was all just a means of the monster under the bed to eat them both! Which they probably could have just done from the get-go while they were sleeping. Or is this kind of like a vampire entering your house rules and the monster can't eat them until they download the app and accept the terms and conditions? Yeah, Marco, I know. They tend to not get any better. So that wasn't his story. Better pop it in another thumb drive and give it another go. This time, a tale of two sisters. The older of them berates her younger sibling's insistence on playing with sticks and rocks on the windowsill. The younger swears it's a game she's playing with her friend outside, Jumpy. But how could that be? They are on the second floor of the house. You ruined our game. No, 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 no. She just adapted it for a modern audience. That taken care of, they can finally get some sleep. But what's this? That night, the older sister is awakened by the sounds of the younger sister off gallivanting and having fun. It turns out she's outside. With the incredibly tall, weird friend that the older sister assumed was imaginary. Come inside, you're not safe out there. What are you so afraid of? He's my friend. He's not going to do anything. Ah! Emma! And it kidnaps her. Because... That's what monsters do! Yeah, Marco, I have no idea how we somehow went downhill on the storytelling, yet here we are. The boogeyman doesn't go away when you get older. He just waits until the right moment to come back. Well, is he going to be coming back anytime soon? Because we're 16 minutes into this thing, and I'd like at some point for it to get scary. Well, our next story is enshrouded in darkness. Color saturation set extremely low. We watch as an old woman, dependent on her oxygen mask, hacks up blood before something even more terrifying emerges. May I have a glass of water, please? Hospitality obligations for guests! Truly, no greater horror exists. And... I don't know what to say about the deets of this particular tale. It's very much visual, an experience, and not really laying out a story per se. She moves away from the creepy child, yet the creepy child remains. Uh, doors go slam slam, creepy kid fills his balloons with her oxygen tank, and she collapses. A, a bug flies out of her mouth, and monster pulls her into the shadows. <laughs> Okay, Marco, remember, we got work in the morning. We can't stay up all night watching shitty movies. The characters in my stories never know what's going to happen to them. Well, most stories aren't packed with clairvoyance. As such, let's start at the next tale, where a few ladies talk about scary things. Like how there is an acceptable amount of rat hair in peanut butter per FDA guidelines. Brain-eating amoebas exist in lake waters. And of course, the thing actually relevant to the story. That when you think you see something out of your peripheral vision, but turn to not see anything, what you think you saw, you really saw the shadow people of unspecified alternate dimension of evil. The whole reason we don't see them when we focus is because of an evolutionary advantage where if you don't notice them, they can't cross over to kill you. So whatever you do, don't acknowledge their presence. So they're like an evil version of John Cena. Or just John Cena, I guess. And of course, now knowing this, what does she do once alone? But realize she is not alone, as she sees shadow people from her peripheral vision. And armed with the knowledge of what they are, cannot help but acknowledge their existence! <laughs> there is a plot somewhere in this movie. We, we, we will be getting to it eventually, right? Oh, Jesus, Marker, you're enjoying this shit show way too much. 
Still not the right one, so on to the next. Where we meet Douchey McDoucheface, who smokes by the no smoking sign, and even walks where they say not to walk on grass. Real missed opportunity that he didn't park at least in front of a fire hydrant or something, or bring a dog, but his license plate reads Troublemaker. Driving where he should not enter, he returns home to take his medicine, which should not be mixed with alcohol with alcohol! Worst of all, he mixes Xbox controllers and PlayStation. But when he sees an emergency alert on TV that for some reason instructs him to not watch it, this time he actually is trying not to, but finds he cannot turn it off. Here he sees some poor bastard in a chair, fish hooks in his flesh, controlled like a marionette to use a telephone. Gotta admit, this is a little more creative than I was expecting. I was figuring this guy was gonna meet his demise after reading the label on a silica packet. He tries to ignore the call, even going so far as to unplug the TV, but it keeps playing. Answering, the man on the other end tells him, do not scream. But when Freaky Deaky Monster Man pops up for half a second, that kind of goes out the window, and the hooks pull the man's flesh off his body. Next thing you know, another call comes, but this time, it's nothing but growly breathing, before fishhook after fishhook slowly descends upon Troublemaker. <laughs> I don't know, what, what, was that actually pretty good? Or are my standards just lowering in record time? Sometimes I don't know the rules either. Well, how the hell do you even make a story if you don't know what your own rules are? So I make up my own. So there are rules in the story, you just... So that, how was... Oh, never mind. We finally have some plot to speak of 38 minutes into this movie. Marco is looking over his pictures in his phone of his wife and best friend. The mysterious person taunting him over it the entire time. Just make you happy. Well, after five damn stories that didn't do diddly to move this plot forward, I'll take what I can get. So let's get right back to pointless stories that go nowhere. A lower class looking fella pulls up to a small mansion with instructions to come inside and find Tiffany. Upon entering, it turns out Tiffany is outside. And considering she does want to be in the same location as this man, that is a bit confusing. But not as confusing as when he follows her into the woods, only to be jumped by a bunch of cultist looking motherfuckers in masks who cast a spell that caused him to be teleported into a hellish post apocalyptic nightmare dimension where a spectral being leaps into him, causing him to expel CGI goop for the cultists to collect in a jar. So, uh, what the hell just happened? Does this body suit you, Mama? Okay, okay, so she summoned this guy over there to use him as a vessel to bring back the soul of her love, and and therefore she could have she could have probably just got like any guy, any anybody, and and for some reason she decided to go with one of the background extras from Eight Mile. That's it for that story, then. Don't ask me how Marco is going about swapping USB drives now. The in-between shots of him have moved on to the guy showing more photos to the security cameras. Yet, somehow, the stories continue. As we see a writer suffering from writer's block, writing about the Gray Man. But she cannot concentrate because constant messages interrupt her. And it only gets worse when she finds out they are from the Gray Man. You're not real! <laughs> And she dies from the Gray Man. Cool. Who the fuck is the Gray Man? Anyway, Marco can spit up blood and we can move on to another story. A grandmother reads a bedtime story, but the boy is scared. Someone is in the closet. Except no one is in the closet. Except there's a weird ghost boy in his room. But the weird ghost boy is not the monster in the closet, no. Grandma is the monster in the closet! <laughs> I think? I, I don't know. If this goes on for much longer, I'm gonna start popping into these stories to kill everybody. Anyway, on to tale number nine. A young lady must study, but she is tired and needs rest. So hey, boyfriend, go home. If you here, I wouldn't be able to resist your sexy ass. I do have a sexy ass. <laughs> okay, I have to be losing my mind because the way this guy is just so proud of his ass is just strangely endearing to me right now. 
But how will she manage to get the studies she needs in the two days that remain before exams? Well, it just so happens that Cousin Anna sends her some audio files in an email telling her simply that it works and she should play them. And so she does. No idea what she's studying, but lesson one just so happens to be about a crazy serial killer whose spirit has a handy dandy incantation tried to it where you can summon it if you say it into a mirror. M. Crow so the first thing she does is say the incantation into a mirror. Jeez, I thought Troublemaker made bad life choices. Surprising no one, this summons the evil spirit who kills her. Anyway, on to story number 10. A babysitter shows up to watch a kid, but the parents are already gone. Not to worry, they call her up and give her the basic instructions on how to care for their little bundle of joy. When he wakes up, should I make him anything? Thank you for taking this on such short notice. We really appreciate you. I have to go. And only the basic instructions. Listen, it's babysitting here. There's no reason to get that deeply involved. Just wing it. There's also oddities like dog food on the ground and a half-eaten dog bowl, but eh, no big deal. The babysitting gig goes about as expected. We get spooky music and weird angles with a way too large spiral staircase. The kid is one step away from Rosemary's baby, and of course there's the monster in the closet to worry about, but that's reinforced with duct tape, so no worries. Until it's suddenly open, and the babysitter has no idea where the kid has run off to. As it turns out, a weird shadow beast was in that closet, and so she rushes for safety. But the dang old kid stays inside, so she goes back in to get him. But before she can, something gets her. Mama, what is a casa a casa? Chocolate meal. Okay, so they just bring babysitters every now and again to feed the thing and the police haven't caught on yet, and the people haven't thought to maybe just say fuck it and move. But what's this? After 10 meaningless tales of everything was fine until it wasn't, we have finally reached Marco's story. Not hard to guess based on the few clues we had, but hey, his friend was boning his wife, and so he murdered the fuck out of both of them! And in the process, their unborn child. And with the only copy of this story, he can keep his illicit deed secret. Unless, of course, this entire movie was being streamed this entire time! That's right, kids. Creepypasta means streaming on Twitch now, I guess. But it's not like he's gonna have to have any greater payments for his crimes anyway, because he just dies right there anyway, his body joining the piles of cadavers already occupying the place. The end. Well, that was far longer than it had any right to be. It wasn't scary. And I could see the twist coming a mile away. I guess it really does make a pretty accurate representation of creepypastas. Creepypasta, the movie, is 90 minutes of my life I'm not getting back. The best I can say about the film is at least the people who put it together had a good sense of cinematography, the acting was adequate, and the whole thing never had any point where it ended up looking cheap. Not bad, as the fact that not counting the main plot, there are 10, 10 different stories we go through, all with different settings, there's a lot more variety in locations than you get out of a standard 90 minute feature film. But yeah, having 10 stories in 90 minutes also means we don't have nearly that much time per story, and they can't hope to be particularly deep. Horror anthology movies tend to have stories that are a bit shallower than you'd get out of 90 minutes of a horror tale, but we barely have enough time to introduce the concept of the horror before the body count rises, and ends because it's time to move on to the next. And while I can say the sets were varied, the stories tend to follow the same structure. It was a normal night. Until it wasn't. It was a normal childhood. Until it wasn't. It was a normal babysitting job. Until it wasn't. There are a couple of exceptions, but not enough to shake up the monotony of the experience of watching this movie. Then there's the main plot throughout, or lack thereof, as while there is an overarching story that is used as an excuse to string the rest together, it isn't nearly deep enough to cover the intro, outro, and nine intermissions between stories. So most of those breaks are just used to remind us that Marco exists. The movie makes less sense if you think about it logically, because if he needed his thumb drive that bad, why is he spending all this time watching unrelated stories to completion? Why did he let his story play out 100%, even not knowing that it's being live streamed? Wouldn't it the first few frames be enough of a clue like, yeah, that's it, take the drive and get out of there? At the end of the day, Creepypasta the movie is not a great film, not a great Creepypasta story, an okay representation of bad Creepypastas we spend most of our time reading, but nothing to celebrate. 
Maybe scary if you've never seen a horror movie before, but at best, this movie makes adequate background noise you don't have to pay attention to, or fodder for a group of bad movie-loving friends to chuckle at while it plays. Coming in at two closet monsters out of five. I wasn't expecting much out of this, but I also ain't expecting a creepypasta too after that. Thank you all for watching. I've been Decker Shadow. And remember, I also read creepypastas every month for channel members. And uh, no, those also don't tend to be any better. I do have a sexy ass. <laughs> and this also is not my first foray into horror anthology movies. We also have Damien Leone's All Hallows' Eve right there. Check out that review. It contains the original Terrifier. And then we've got the algorithmically selected whatever that is. I don't know. The algorithm don't like me. I don't gotta like it either.